Okay. So let's prove this theorem. So first of all, uh, we can uh, we can use we can use the first uh, we can use the previous theorem to argue about the first part of this new theorem. So what does it say? Let pi be defined like this, which is the same definition as in the previous theorem. And then pi is the unique sigma finite measure on E cross G such that blah, blah, blah. So, well, this is the same thing appearing here, right? Pi is the unique sigma finite measure on E cross G such that on measurable rectangles, this is this. So uh, in other words, the first statement, the first sentence up to part A follows as a corollary to the previous theorem. So proof. So by seeing lambda as a kernel, as we discussed, it follows from the previous theorem that pi is a sigma finite measure. And pi d cross f is what? So pi d cross f in the previous theorem was the integral of k with respect to nu over the set d. So now it's going to be lambda f nu dx over the set d, which is just going to give us what? Lambda f times nu d for d in E and f in G. So when you specialize into uh, measurable rectangles, you get what you want. You, you get this product, right? That's why it's called the product, right? In fact, for measurable rectangles, it is exactly product. This is just like how you, uh, for instance, calculate the area of a rectangle, right? You look at the measure of this side and the measure of that side and multiply the two values. So here, this is like d cross f. And you have different measures, nu of d, lambda of f. And the value that is assigned to this rectangle by the product measure the pi is just nu d lambda f. This is the area in some sense. Well, let's show Fubini's theorem. Uh, this needs a proof. So up to now, everything is like a corollary to the previous theorem. But now we really have to prove something. So to prove that we can switch the order, swap the order of integration. So, well, this equality, right? This equality. So to prove that we can swap the order of integration, we proceed in three steps. Okay. So this is a theorem that holds for every positive measurable function. Okay. So in the first place, you would want to prove it for what? What kind of functions? Indicators. But even indicators are difficult this time. So in, in some proofs, indicate, checking something for indicators is trivial, right? It's just one line. And then you use linearity and monotone convergence, blah, 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 to pass to positive measurable functions. But even indicators here are difficult, because indicator of a set is what? The set can be very crazy. But indicators of special sets are easier. And these are measurable rectangles. So we're going to prove it for 
indicators of measurable rectangles than indicators for indicators of measurable sets using monotone class theorem. And then to, we're going to extend the result to positive measurable functions, positive measurable functions using linearity to pass to simple positive functions and monotone convergence theorem. This is our strategy. So let's start with number one. Well, pi of indicator of d cross f, right? Let me fix some measurable rectangle, d in E, f in G. So this is what? We just calculated that this is lambda f times nu d, right? Nu d times lambda f. Well, this is just lambda f times nu d, and this is uh, So let me write it this way. So on E first, then G of indicator D cross F of XY, um, lambda and nu. And we show that this is equal to uh, nu d cross lambda f. Let me change the order here, OK? I want to write the first measure first. Sorry about the change. Okay. I want to have d because it's the first set, so it should stand as the first set. So I can change the order because it's a times b equals b times a, right? So if I believe that this integral gives me this, I would also believe and also check that I can swap the order. This is d cross f, x, y, nu dx, lambda dy. Because it is just the indicator of a rectangle. So it is, in fact, indicator d times indicator f. So you can do the integration in any order you want. So checking it for measurable rectangles is not very difficult. Right? So this behaves as a constant in the first integral. So I can take it out. And then this is going to give me what? Nu of d. Nu of d. And is, then I'm going to integrate indicator of f with respect to lambda. So I will get just lambda of f times nu of d. So it is, it is not uh, a big deal. So we're done with step one. Any questions about step one? So the most primitive form of Fubini's theorem is A times B is B times A, in a sense, right? We, we have it. So now how to pass to uh, indicators of general measurable sets? Well, we have to use a monotone class theorem because we have the result for a pi system. The measurable rectangles form a pi system. So I have to define a collection of sets for which I have this result. I have issue with the space here. Let me write it like this. And let me put the parentheses properly. So that is the set of measurable sets. I cannot write here A is a subset of E cross G. 
because then the integral would not be well defined. So to be able to talk about integral, it has to be a measurable function in the first place. So I cannot write it this way. In many proofs, whenever we define a Dinkin system, usually it is just fine to let it be an arbitrary subset without measurability requirement. But here I need measurable measurability requirement because I'm talking about integrals. Okay? So, so unfortunately, I cannot do it this way. So it is the set of A's for which Fubini's theorem holds for its indicator. Okay? And I know that, so by one, measurable rectangles are in D. If we can show, this time I'm going to show that D is a Dinkin system, OK? I'm not going to leave it as an exercise, because it is not a trivial one this time, OK? We have to worry about things. So if we can show that D is a Dinkin system, we would conclude by monotone class theorem that D is, well, E cross G is a subset of D, but this time it's going to be equal to D because my sets are already coming from E cross G. So that we get what we want. Namely, that we have the equality for every measurable set A in the product space. So all we have to do is to check that D is a Dinkin system on the product space. So let's show D is a Dinkin system on E cross G. Well, OK. Uh, I'm going to use the alternative definition of Dinkin system, because uh, the, usual, the original definition had disjoint sets. The alternative definition had increasing sets. So uh, to be able to use monotone convergence theorem, let's use the alternative definition appearing in the homework um, so that we have already increasing sets. Uh, in, in one of the proofs in the first hour, I uh, was checking that something is a measure. But in the definition of measure, we have uh, just disjoint sets. So we had to create the increasing sequence ourselves. But now that we have an alternative definition of Dinkin system with monotone sequence, we can use that. Okay? So alternative definition. Alternative. So the first property was that uh, the omega, what is the omega now? E cross G is in D. Well, why is that? This is because E cross G is a measurable rectangle. So it comes for free from part one, right? The full set is a measurable rectangle itself. So by part one, we already have that this is in E as it is a measurable rectangle. So now let's show that if A, B are in D, and A is a subset of B, then B minus A is in D. Let's show this. This is what we're going to show. So what does that mean? A is in D, B is in D. So this means we have indicator B, lambda dy, nu dx equals, well, this is second space, first space, and the other way around. And I have the same thing for A. I'm not going to write it in full. 
it's too boring, right? Uh, new and lambda uh, for a for a. E cross G, G and F, G and E. And what we want to have is that B minus A has the same property. Can I say this? If I have the equality for B and A, can I pass to B minus A? What is the indicator of B minus A if A is a subset of B? So we have indicator B minus A is indicator B minus indicator A, right? Since A is a subset of B. But still, I'm asking, can I subtract the second equation from the first equation to get the third using linearity of integral, right? Can I do that all the time? Can you ever have some issues? It's a subtraction, not addition, right? What can go wrong? Exactly. We can have infinities. Why? Because, well, this is a bounded function, but the measures are not finite, maybe. If they are just sigma finite measures, you can have an infinity and another infinity, and this is not going to give you is something meaningful. It's going to give you infinity minus infinity. So we can conclude B minus A is in D if we have that nu and lambda are finite measures. Whereas in the theorem, I assume they are sigma finite. Where are they? Uh, here, sigma finite. So let's add this assumption, OK? So this means we can now only do the proof for finite measures. So let's assume for now that new lambda are finite. So. It's a fact of life. We cannot subtract two infinities. But with this assumption, we can do it because now they are finite numbers. OK? So assuming this, everything's fine. What is the last item? So if a1, a2 are actually increasing, right? So they are in D, okay, then the union is in D. Well, how can we do it? Well, if I have an increasing sequence, I have also their indicators increase to the indicator of the union, their positive functions. So I have indicator AN, lambda dy nu dx equals indicator a n nu lambda for all n. All we have to do is to let n go to infinity. If we let n go to infinity, I have a limit here and the limit here. And using monotone convergence theorem, I can first pass it inside the first integral, and then applying it again, we can get it inside the second integral. And this is going to give us, so applying 
monotone convergence theorem twice gives us indicator of the union has the same property. So union is in D. So D is a thinking system under this assumption. We no longer need this theorem, so let me erase this part. So what were we doing? We were following our strategy, right? We did part one. We did part two only partially, only for finite case. So we have to do part two for sigma finite case, OK? So far, we have this swapping property, double star. for all A in script, G, script E, script G, under the assumption of finiteness of measures. Let's extend it to the sigma finite case. So nu is sigma finite. This is going to give you a measurable partition, partition such that new EI is finite. And lambda is sigma finite. This is going to give you another partition. Such that lambda of g, j is finite for all i. So again, we have this grid, right? So E1, E2, E3, G1, G2, G3. And as before, so E, I, G, J's form a measurable rectangle uh, partition of E cross G and pi E I lamb uh, sorry uh, pi E I cross G J is new E I lambda G J so it is finite for all i and j. So what we'd like to show is that if we take a, an arbitrary measurable set, let's say a set like this, We also have the same swapping property. So let's look at indicator A, xy, lambda dy, nu dx. And hopefully, this is going to be equal to the opposite one.
we already built this property for wh when the measures are finite. So now we have to extend it to the sigma finite case. So what can we do for the sigma finite case? Can you look at it on some regions where it is finite, on the, where the measures are finite? What are those regions? Partitions, yeah. So I need to look at A over each of those rectangles in my grid, partitioning the product space. Right? For instance, for this specific example, I have this part, this part, this part, right? It is intersection with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine sets. So what I can do is to intersect my A with each of those rectangles. In other words, I can see A as the union of A intersection EI cross GJ. And then the indicator is going to become a double sum of A intersection EI cross GJ. And note that the restriction of nu on EI and lambda on GJ are finite measures, are finite. What is the restriction of a measure? Well, you know tracing, right? If you have a sigma algebra, you can restrict it. You can trace it on a smaller set. And for those sets, if you just consider the value of your measure for those sets in the trace, this becomes the restriction of your, of your uh, measure on the smaller set. So if you restrict nu from the big E to EI, one of those EIs, it becomes a finite measure. If you restrict your lambda to one of those GJs, it becomes a finite measure. So you can use your previous step, not the step, but the previous result, so this one, under the blue assumption, the finiteness assumption, uh, you can use it. So if we write it as indicator A intersection EI cross GJ, right, lambda dy, New dx. Well, we can do several things. First of all, these infinite sums can go outside. Everything's positive, so use monotone series form once and then twice. And then what do we get? Well, it is the indicator of this function integrated over E and G. So I can see it as the integral over EI, integral over GJ. I'm making my spaces smaller of the same function. Doesn't matter. At the end of the day, we're only interested in the part of A in EI and GJ since we are now in this double sum. We're just looking at one term of that double sum. xy, lambda dy, nu dx. So now I can swap the order, because now I make my spaces smaller. So now I have finite measure. I'm seeing it as the restriction of this measure on gj, and seeing nu as the restriction of it on ei. Okay. Now these are finite measures. So finite, finite. So I can swap my, my order. OK. 
okay? The same expression, okay? And I can also write it as without the gj, just on g, just on e, the same expression. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter. I always keep my indicator like that. I never get rid of my ei, ej here. So now everything is symmetric. I can put them back using mon series again. So let me say mon series once and then mon series twice here and we are done. So I use mon series again and now I get what I want. <clears throat> OK, so we have to finish this proof. Uh, OK, so. We have number three here. But uh, this is passing from indicators of sets to positive measurable functions using linearity and monotonicity. So I will leave it as an exercise. So three is left as an exercise. So all you need to do is to pass from indicators to simple positive functions and then take limits to get the result for f. So this is by linearity, this is by monotone convergence. This would finish the proof of Fubini. We still need to prove Tonelli. OK. And hopefully, it's, it's going to be over very soon. So we, we did the hard work already. OK. So any questions so far? So I wanted to uh, do this proof in the lecture although it is very long and sometimes very boring, um, because you use uh, the good main results that we learned, linearity, monotone convergence, monotone class arguments, so all the main results that we learned, and they all appear in this proof all together. So it's, it's a good exercise to go over every single piece of this proof and uh, fill out the details, right? Um, it's still a technical proof, of course, but, but I think it is very uh, uh, instructive to go through this proof because of those details and uh, the results that we use all the time, right? OK. So let's finish this proof. And hopefully, we're going to have some time for an application. So let's say f is a pi integrable function. Let pi be, uh, sorry, f be a pi integrable function on e cross g. Well, what, is, what does this say? So let's say we look at pi f plus and pi f minus. They are all finite, right? Uh, not inverse, of course, minus. 
For instance, if you look at pi f plus, this is both f with respect to lambda and then with respect to nu, or the other way around by Fubini, because f plus is positive, Fubini. And you can have the same for pi f minus. And since these are finite, you can subtract them to get the result for pi f. So you still have star. So double star holds for pi f. So we proved this part, not the others. Let's look at the others. Let's look at the others. Well, I, I forgot to put plus here, sorry. Right. So, in this integral, what we do is to fix x and see it as a function of y. This is what we integrate, right? So I can see it as the integral of the restriction, uh, the section of f to x. And similarly, this is the integral of the section of f to y. So we have pi f equals, so we have the same for here, right? So pi f equals e, integral of e, of this function, nu dx. And also the other one. Let's do the first one. What does that mean? So if you have an integral that is finite, uh, well, let me write real number. If the integral of a function is a real number, what can you say about that function? Does it have to be finite? Yes. If it has an infinite value with a strictly positive measure, then the integral would just be infinity, right? So we must have that this integrand lambda, not plus, lambda f x equals x is finite for nu almost every x. What does that mean? Well, this is just f x y lambda dy on the second space. So f x equals x is lambda integrable. Integral being finite means what? It f the, the integrand is integrable, right? For nu almost every x in R. Uh, the other case is symmetric. The other case is symmetric. Namely, looking at the other variable is symmetric. So we're done. You can do the same for the other way of looking at it. Sure. I couldn't understand why you took x from the real numbers. Because x from the real numbers? Oh, no, of course not. Sorry. x is in e, of course. Thank you. It's just a typo. Did I do the same typo here? No. No. Well, I, I should have written maybe something like this. OK. 
Okay. Again, typo. Now, now it's okay. And you can do the same here, right? I can make it a x0 and y0. Just a dummy variable so I can give any way I want, any, any name I want. Hard work, but it's over. So now it's ready for our use. We're going to use it a lot in the rest of the course. First of all, we can, uh, using this measure, using this theorem, we can talk about the Lebesgue measure on R2. Lebesgue measure on R2. Just by this definition, right? Uh, so I have R, Borel R, and the Lebesgue measure, the product of this space by itself, which I'm going to write as R2, Borel R2. We discussed Borel on R2 before. And now we're going to call it the two-dimensional Lebesgue measure. So it is Lebesgue cross Lebesgue. What does that mean? Well, the Lebesgue measure on a measurable rectangle is just the Lebesgue measure of the first set times the Lebesgue measure of the second set. So it's kind of the area of this rectangle. Right? So if you have 1 to 2 and 3 to 5. This is your measurable rectangle. So Lebesgue 2, let's call it, so this is 1, 2, cross 3, 5. It is what? Lebesgue measure of 1, 2 times Lebesgue measure of 3, 5, which is 2 minus 1 times 5 minus 3, 2 the area of this rectangle. And it is defined not only for rectangles, but also any Borel subset of R2. Right? So, uh, sorry, Lebesgue 2 of a set. Let's say A is a Borel subset of R2. How is this defined? Well, this is x, y, dx, dy. Okay. You know, when we have Lebesgue integral, integral with respect to Lebesgue measure, we always write just dx. And by Fubini, we also have the other way around. You can integrate with respect to the second variable first. And it is, uh, so, so once you have this Lebesgue measure on R2, you can talk about more general measures. For instance, let's say you have a random vector xy, random vector on some probability space, omega fp with values in R2, OK? So it's a vector in R2, random vector on R2. Uh, suppose 
the, the joint distribution of x and y, which I'm just going to write as pi dx dy. So let's say pi is the distribution of this vector under p. So it is given as follows. It starts like an exponential distribution. And then there is a second part, which is not free of x. So if this were uh, just a function of y, just a probability density function, with, which does not depend on x, we could have just separated it as the distribution of x and distribution of y. So now it is not like that. Okay? Uh, what I'd like to do is to find the distributions of x and y. So what is distribution of x? What is distribution of y? Okay. Um, Today we have time only to discuss the distribution of x, which is the easier one. Next time we're going to discuss the distribution of y. Okay? So it's going to be the first example that we're going to look at uh, next time, uh, namely Friday morning. Okay? So let's look at the distribution of x. What, what does it mean to calculate the distribution of x? Well, just take a Borel set. and calculate this probability, right? Of course, if you cannot do it, at least you can give me a cumulative distribution function and or maybe probability density function. But let's try to calculate it. How, how can we calculate it? Well, we only know the joint distribution, but I can see it as x is in d and y is anything. By the way, I forgot to say that here x is positive and y is real. That's important information. So all we have to do is to integrate over d and r this form. Let me put the Um, the y here and the x here. Well, let me first write it this way. Okay. Uh, I want to use Fubini, so let's write it this way. dx, uh, dx here and dy here. So this is an integral over d cross r, d cross r. So using Fubini for the Lebesgue measure on r2. So this is Fubini for Leb2. I can do the integration in any order I want. This is the order I want. So this d is the dx part. And here, I'm going to have the dy part. So let me just write here 2 pi x. And let me put the ce to negative cx dx here. It's free of y. And this is an integral over r. Let me write it as minus 2 plus infinity. What is the value of this integral? Minus 2 plus infinity, e to negative y squared over 2x divided by square root of 2 pi x. Why? With mean and variance, what? Variance is what? x. 2 pi x, right? And 2x. So it is the PDF of Gaussian distribution with mean zero variance x. Variance x is totally fine. I'm inside the f this integral. Okay, We are here. This is for fixed x. It's totally fine. 
So this is just one, so that we get c e to negative c x d x. What is the conclusion? I have to write the conclusion somewhere. The conclusion is that. For every Borel set D, we have this expression. Of course, Borel on the positive part, because x is positive. x is a positive random variable. What does that tell us? This tells us that this is the, this is the probability density function of x, or this is probability x in dx, namely the distribution of x. So whenever I ask you to calculate the distribution of random variable, of a random variable, your answer should be of the form this. So x is exponential with parameter c. Of course, I forgot to say c is just a positive constant. Okay, just a positive constant. Uh, so let me stop here. So next time, we're going to start by calculating the distribution of y. Okay, let's stop for today. <laughs>